All right. So let me just take, give you a little history and then I'll take you through what my students did because today I'm here celebrating and representing them. Um, and I graduated from Utah State with my PhD in 95. And prior to that, I was, um, I was able to meet some of my greatest heroes, one of whom was James Moffat. And of course, for those of you who are educators or English people, you know that he believed that, that for students to learn, they have to be empowered and be able to um, effectively have some, some control over their learning. They don't need to just be said, this is what you have to learn and that's it. And so I put that away and, you know, I went through and started teaching. And three years ago, I, did, I came upon the idea of starting a new MA in English in our school. And um, I said, okay, I've been studying critical literacy for the last 10 years, and I think I want to do it on critical literacy. And this shouldn't be hard because I'm sure there's lots of programs in the United States that I can use as models. There are none. <laughs> And I didn't know that. I did find one very good certificate program at Ohio State that, you know, I, I depended on a lot. So I did begin um, and, write, and, and had a lot of help from my um, partners in our department. But we got it through SACS, and while I was waiting for SACS approval, I wanted to learn some more about literacy. So I found this particular website that was talking about open resources and I had no idea what that was. And um, I got involved in a course and we had to have a project. And so, just like stupidity reigns, I said, I think I'll design a book for my new class because there are no textbooks for the very first class in our masters. And um, the person who is in charge, Una, is somewhere. Well, maybe, oh, there she is. She said, a book? I said, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Uh, it, was, it was so crazy. Um, I was so silly. But anyway, so the master's, of course, got sax approval. And we started officially this semester. But I have been gathering resources for the first book, which is Intr Introduction to Literacy. And Without really knowing it, I went right back to what James Moffat told me all those years ago. And, and I said, well, I want to see what the students can do. And I don't know about all of you, but our school has no money for anything. And uh, they've been pleading poverty for so long, we've forgotten what the word means. So I wanted to highlight today the students' work as they walked into my class and I had given them, I ordered no textbook because there really wasn't one. And I really wanted a book that could be changed just as fast as literacy changes. And the definition changes. And I wanted them to experience the idea that literacy is not just about reading at a certain level. That doesn't make you literate, that there are many kinds of literacies and they are literate in things that I am not literate in. And, um, and this was precipitated because my university is in southwest Georgia. And the state statistics say we have an illiteracy rate in that area of 90%, or 19%. And actually it hovers between 40 and 50% illiteracy based on our definition as um, a state, I guess. But they don't want to advertise that. So I've been really worried about that issue. So when my students came to me after I um, presented them and we talked about uh, a variety of articles, I said, OK, guess what we're going to do this semester? We're going to create the textbook for the next class. And they just looked at me. And I said, so we're going to start with a timeline. And um, I divided them up. And there really were only five students in that class. So I divided the whole history of literacy up into five parts. Oh, it was wonderful. They were so thrilled. <laughs> and the smallest part was 2000 until today. Why do you think I made that part a separate section? 
Anybody have any ideas? The thing is, everything has seemed to have happened from the 90s forward, and there's so much that that needed a separate section. And it really teaches us that it's not going to stop at this point. So the kids did their timeline, and I said, oh, a timeline is so boring, isn't it? I mean, who wants to sit and read a timeline? And then I started showing them some examples of what it meant to create an open piece of an open resource. And I said, you know, what do you like to do? And I heard this in a presentation earlier about games. Well, I had just come from a national conference, and one of the sessions I attended talked about how games were evolving, not, not the shoot em up bang bang kind, but, the, but games were evolving, so students had to be People playing had to have, make decisions. Like, if I decide to destroy this country, what will I lose, or what will we all lose, uh, the rest of us? And I was fascinated by how in depth they could be. So, one of the things that I'm going to do um, the next time is we're going to work on a game that talks about the changes in literacy, not only the definition, but the political implications of that and see how that works. But so far, they've been in class um, since late August, and they started on this about the middle of September, and I brought two students' work to kind of show you how they're progressing. Now, they start with, first they have to do all the research, you know, for the timeline, and they get so excited because they're actually learning things that they didn't know, and I'm not having to lecture to them. And so then, let's see if I can get this to work. I don't have my own computer, so this may take a minute. Mm, that's, I guess I should have, yeah, I don't know how to make it run. <laughs> just hit the space bar. You just want to advance your slides. Yeah, I just want to advance it. Okay. So this, my first student had the history of literacy from, from the beginning of time to, I think, the Gutenberg Press. And he, um, one thing that I allowed them to do in this is I said to them, if you can't find open resources, and I basically presented a workshop on open resources that I had given to my, to my faculty earlier that year. But I said, if you can't find an open resource, I just want to make sure that you document where you found your resource. And what I will do is go back and try to find an open resource that gives us the same information. Uh, barring that, I may go and talk to the authors of who hold the copyright, but I haven't had to do that yet. So you'll see some places where they have documented, especially in this first one, where they have documented where they got the sources and, um, and they're not open resources. But I'm less worried about that um, I want them to experience the creativity involved in having an open textbook. So, so these are just some of the pictures. And you know the student obviously was looking from the very beginning. And he was so excited about talking about how language spreads and, and transforming the modern, um, the modern alphabet. And I thought this was really unique because I didn't tell them to do this. Do you want to learn more? Check out this website. And I thought, what a great idea. I wouldn't have thought of that. He thought of that. And so, do you want to learn more? And this is a different one. And he hasn't stuck with one website. He's given a variety of resources. And as a member of the faculty, you know, I'm lucky if I have time to find a couple of resources for the students to look at. But by opening it up and allowing them to search too and become part of that process, they are not only learning, but they're also helping me. It's like having a teaching assistant sometimes. And in a small university, you don't have one of those. OK, and so then he goes into some straight text. And he was so funny, he apologized every time he just had, I'm sorry, this overlaps a little bit. But, but I thought that you know he brings it in. And this one, he was so proud of. He says, that's in connections. That one's that one's OK. And I said, that's fine. That's great. And he would call me every time he found an open resource and say, I just can't believe it. So 
Okay, so this is what he, this is the end of his um, time period. And he has, um, he, <laughs> he called me this weekend. I came in early and he called me this weekend. He said, I found so much more. Can't you integrate it? And I went, uh, no. <laughs> I will do that when I get back. <laughs> so, I mean, I just, I'm so happy to have them not just actively learning, but actively being involved in the process. And because they're talking about this knowledge in ways that has not, happened um, in the past. And, you know, my, my chair said, well, that's probably because they're grad students. Well, maybe it is, but when I'm able to do this in my undergraduate classes, I also get this kind of reaction. So, anyway, so then we go to the next one, and she was very, she's a very visual learner, and I think that becomes pretty apparent with her slides. So she uses, and she loves to play with text, and so she is, um, she's really good about finding cartoons and stuff like that that illustrate what was going on in her time period. Okay, so here she's, you know, you can see she's talking about the spread of information. And I don't, I'm not sure, but it seems like she doesn't have a slide that doesn't have something on it that's unique. And, and here she's trying to show you how after the press was invented, what started happening when, all, when the Gutenberg press started spreading. Now, honestly, if I'd been writing about the, it or constructing some kind of information about the Gutenberg press, number one, it would have taken me forever to have time to do all that research. But also, I probably would have never done this. And yet, this is such a great visual for students to kind of see, you know, how, how one, one invention has spread and shared so much for us. And um, I'm not going to um, play it for you, but she actually has embedded in here a YouTube video that um, is set, and I can't remember where the, the actual first Gutenberg Press is located, but they're in that library, they have a YouTube video that shows how it printed, and the text it printed, and shows how you have to have two people, and that's embedded in, it may be on this one down here on the wiki, but um, it was so fascinating because all the students who were watching, and some of my undergrads came in because they wondered why everybody was having so much fun, so which was okay with me. <laughs> okay, so she left. She left the Gutenberg, and then she and I didn't tell her to do this. Um, she went and looked at women in literacy because uh, the other graduate course is dealing with uh, uh, women's literature, so which I'm not teaching. But anyway, she uh, went through there and she found this person and I said, I had never heard of her. How many of you have heard of Sora Juana Inez de la Cruz? Anybody? Okay, so, um, I mean, and that was just one of the things. She's comparing her to Mary Wollstonecraft. Well, if you're an English person, you probably know that her daughter was Mary Shelley who wrote Frankenstein and she was an advocate for women and but Dela Cruz had never entered my mind. And what was so amazing was, you know, I had, I had really thought about how do we make sure that we have incorporated everybody. I don't want a lot, I'm sorry, I don't want a lot of dead white men, nor do I just want a mix of dead white men and dead white women. And so, and here she is, and she was excited because she is Hispanic. And she said, now I've represented my culture and I didn't, you know. So I was, that was kind of a double learning experience for all of us. Okay, so did that come up? That's just, I think, another picture. But she was actually, um, she actually, I think, was so ostracized for wanting to be, wanting to read and wanting to write and wanting to learn that, you know, she went through some very 
very interesting, I'm not going to tell you, but some very interesting moves to try to have that opportunity. Okay, and so then, of course, she, here's one without a picture, wow. <laughs> The golden age of libraries and how that increased, and we kind of um, know that. But, let's see, okay, and then on this, the impact of literacy, and this is where the kids are the most interested. They hadn't ever tied um, who the power structure of wherever you were to who defined literacy. The very first article, or the very first piece I had them read was a chapter out of Paulo Freire's work and they hadn't heard of him and so they were amazed that this man in South America had done all this in the efforts of literacy. So then they have tried to tie, they're finding many political connections and I didn't give them that information, I gave them some good, I think, articles that led them in that direction, but it was very exciting for them to see how things change and how politics and power pay, play a big part in how literate we are. And then she found a copy of, you know, that when we had coffee houses and um, people got together, and that explains that one. And then that's the end. So I guess what I want you to see is that I was able, because I was interested, I was able to open up, even though I didn't know, I still feel like I know about this much, maybe not even that much, of how effective using open resources can be. However, I think my students are going to walk away from this course and go into their next course with so much knowledge that I would have never had had they not have brought it to me. And so, one of, and this is kind of a, a consequence of open resources. When we can go out and find everything for them, we get excited about it, but we would sometimes wonder why aren't they as excited about it? Well, because they didn't have anything to do with finding the information. So I'm really um, looking forward. We've got, we'll have another three chapters done before the end of this semester, and then we're going to continue to work on it and to add to it because five students keeps, they, and they told me, they said, we can't cover everything that's happened. So they're going to keep adding information to that. And this is the very beginning of the master's program. It's our first course. And so I think that will provide a foundation for years to come as more students add their knowledge and to our work. So that's what I wanted to share with you to give the kids a chance. And I will say that they will all be listed as um, in the, you know, when we get the whole thing together, their names are all going to show up. They're going to get credit for everything they do. And um, I think that this is, you know, in an age when there's not a lot of money for um, education, they will have already got some credit for the work that they did on this very initial book in their first program. So, or their first class in a master's program. So I'm excited about it, and um, I think that as I start showing this to my administration, that then I can lobby for money to send them out and let them present for them themselves. And then I can sit in the background maybe and just clap really loud. <laughs> so, okay, so I guess I can open for questions. I hope that, yes sir. I just wanted to be clear, you, you said you used the wiki to construct this, so what we were looking at is, I guess, two chapters of the book that mm -hmm. are on the same web, web space, right? Um, actually, I've put them on our learning management system right now. Oh, we okay. haven't even loaded it to the wiki yet. Okay. okay. Well, I did have another question. Okay. Can, how do you assess this type of work? Do you start with a rubric of your own to try and see if they're complying with what you want from them? 
to and they have that to rubric. Have expectations mm -hmm. yourself as far as learning. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And they and this isn't all they do in that class. They have to. They are going to present when I get back. They're going to present to a group of teachers that I've been working with in the National Writing Project and show them about open resources and then, you know, and I'll help them, but I want them to be the ones on stage. <laughs> and, um, and they also have to do a seminar paper on their particular period and present that to the, to the university. Um, and that's all. They have a lot to do. <laughs> but yes, I did. I give the, I always give my students a rubric before they ever have an assignment, so that they understand who their audience is. Thank so, you. yes, sir. Thanks. Um, I suppose I'm wondering what you think critical literacy is. You know, my students ask me that, and I said to them, I said, you know, it's more than reading and writing, and it's changing every day. It's reading, writing, speaking. And it's texting, it's all those media. And that's why it's very easy. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to develop that a little bit. Um, because it seems to me that someone could just get most of the information from this presentation from a few minutes on Wikipedia, you know how to use something like Wikipedia. If they did. That, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're using it in a critical sense. Because to me, critical thinking, critical literacy, critical theorizing, involves maybe uh, challenging things. Whereas this seems more like this is almost like a cut and paste exercise. Well, yes, right now it is. But we're going to expand in every area that's already up there. And um, because I ask them to do this part, but I don't, I'm not suggesting that I'm going to let this go without adding to it. So, yes. I was curious about the questions at the end of the one chapter, the first one we saw, were these questions that the student was positive? Yes. And yes. So to me, that ties into what this right. is saying. And they're all doing that. They're all saying, they're all saying, well, I've got to learn more about this. Um, what about this? Is this connection that, you know, they're all doing that in class. And which is um, heartening because I usually have to post the questions and then wait for the silence. You know, so I think that you're right about what they have done, but really in a very few weeks and not knowing anything that they haven't, that they've done a lot, that they've created a lot. And I, I don't know. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Just because I'm a cyclic board in my class, I know some of the citations were from Wikipedia. Are you encouraging your students to go back into the sources from Wikipedia and use those sources instead because I am, but you know, um, it's a funny thing because when I took the class with Una, we were talking about the end and she was asking me about my resources and I kept saying, well, this is a wiki book and this is a wiki, and you know, she, and she said, did anything surprise you? And I said, because I have just said, do not use Wikipedia at all under any circumstances, don't use it. And then I found, you know, these great play these great books and they have been peer reviewed and that's the other thing I'm not going to do anything with this until I have peer reviews because it's really to me not valid unless people who um, do deal in my in my area have a chance to look at it and say just exactly what he said well it looks like a cut and paste activity and it does right now okay yes sir I'm Jacques Duplessis from the University of Wisconsin. First of all, I want to commend you on taking this step and moving in this direction. And I can see that, you know, it's still a project that's fairly young and will gain sophistication and so forth. And I think we all recognize that in this field, that it is that way. And uh, so to come with a high bar immediately, uh, um, you know, it's not very practical. But I think all of us involved in this realize our shortcomings and where we need, still need to get. Now I want to set a challenge for you for down the road, not for now, but I had to preface it with the comments I just made. I see a lot of people doing just what you're doing. And I think the next step is to see how we can, how you can find out who else is doing something similar to you. And to be on a platform where you can uh, connect with each other and collectively develop it. Right. And get more, just like Wikipedia developed. 
um, do that thing. In, in fact, something interesting that I you know there is this thing against Wikipedia with many faculty. It's just like um, you're from <laughs> the outer darkness if you go come from Wikipedia site. But I did a little research on that. The argument is that Wikipedia has more errors than Encyclopedia Britannica, so that's why we, we would prefer Encyclopedia Britannica. You know what? It's true. For every four errors in Wikipedia, there are three in Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the big bang? You know? Well, and I'm finding more and more. Um, I do tell my students, especially in my core classes and my undergraduate courses, you need to go find. Did you yeah. <laughs> I'm done? <laughs> no, you'll, get, you'll get this when you're done. Oh, okay. Uh, well, she may have done that, and I didn't catch it. Uh, but I, I do believe that, you know, this, the resources are out there, and that's why I'm not... I want to be able to kind of expand on their search, and that's going to give me more information to show them how to go deeper as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, and I'm going to tell my students to love you.